In the headlines, President Park Geun-hye urges North Korea to improve its dismal human rights record and to end its nuclear weapons programs in her first UN General Assembly address. North Korea holds its second legislative meeting this year with a major decision expected to be approved possibly on personnel or social affairs. And U.S. President Barack Obama calls for international efforts to fight against Islamic State militants, while another IS video has been released, this time showing the beheading of a French hostage. Welcome to the program. You're watching Primetime News, live from Seoul. I am Kang Teddy. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for joining us. We begin in New York, where President Bakane made her debut at the UN General Assembly, where she outlined her vision for a peaceful, united Korea. And uh, she said it all starts with the baby steps, like creating an international peace park and the DMZ. However, she also did not let North Korea off the hook when it comes to human rights abuses. Chi Yusun reports from New York. While urging Pyongyang to lay down its nuclear arms and to start looking after its people's livelihood, President Bak also asked the world leaders for their cooperation in first tearing down non-political barriers between the two Koreas. In particular, she talked about her earlier proposal to build a peace park in the peninsula's demilitarized zone. UN 주도하에 남북한, 미국, 중국 등 전쟁 당사자들이 참여하여 국제적인 규범과 가치를 존중하며 공헌을 만든다면 그것은 한반도 긴장 완화와 평화 통일의 시금석이 될 것입니다. The president then brought attention to human rights abuses inside North Korea. 또한 국제 사회는 탈북민의 인권 문제에도 관심을 기울여야 합니다. 탈북민들이 자유 의사에 따라 목적지를 선택할 수 있도록 UN 해당 기구와 관련 국가들이 필요한 지원을 제공해야 합니다. The Korean president also called past and present wartime sex abuse on women a serious rights issue thought to be an implicit reference to Japan's former enslavement of Korean women. She then promoted her envisioned trust-building process in Northeast Asia amid tensions over historical and territorial differences. Reflecting how far Korea has come since joining the UN 23 years ago, President Bak also highlighted Seoul's contributions to various global issues such as sustainable development, climate change and education. Choi Yusun, Arirang News, New York. Decision makers in North Korea's parliament met this Thursday for the second time this year. No official word on the meeting has been released just yet. However, key topics are said to be personnel appointments and policy measures. But what's really uh, piquing the curiosity of those watching this meeting from outside the regime are the whereabouts of leader Kim Jong-un. Ji myung has more. The 13th Supreme People's Assembly has convened its second session of the year, following the first in April. The day-long meeting has brought together more than 650 delegates who will be making personnel decisions on key officials. Among them, Hwang byung -se, the director of the powerful General Political Bureau of Pyongyang's Korean People's Army, who could be nominated as vice chairman of the National Defense Commission. North Korean Premier Park bong joon may be asked to stay in his post, and Choi ryong hye a key confidant of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, could be named again to the country's top sports post, succeeding Kim's uncle Chang song tae who was executed last December. At the legislative meeting, delegates were also set to announce a number of major policy measures, such as overhauling the country's mandatory schooling and conscription systems. Observers are also monitoring whether leader Kim Jong-un is in attendance. According to his whole-based Yanam News Agency, it's believed he was absent from Thursday's session. Kim has not appeared in any North Korean media coverage since his last public appearance at a music concert on September 3rd. 
Speculation about possible health problems has surfaced as he has been seen walking with a limp in recent news reports released by state media. Kim young gil Arirang News. More than a month has passed since Seoul proposed holding high-level talks with Pyongyang over pending inter-Korean issues. And yet, though the offer remains open, it also sits unanswered. Hwang Sung-hee reports on how South Korea's unification minister extended the offer once again. Speaking at a forum in Seoul on Thursday, South Korea's top policymaker for inter-Korean affairs had a message for North Korea. In order to solve pending issues, South and North Korea must put their heads together, see each other, and talk. Our government is willing to discuss all issues brought to the table. North Korea has been sitting on a South Korean offer for high-level talks made last month, saying Seoul must first stop civic activists from flying anti-Pyongyang leaflets before any meetings can take place. Unification Minister Ryu gil also noted the importance of international cooperation in preparing for reunification. He said more economic projects like the Najin Hasan Railway project with the two Koreas and Russia are under consideration. We think a five-way project involving the two Koreas, China, Russia and Japan is also possible. Touching upon President Park Geun-hye's speech at the United Nations, Liu also promised efforts to improve the dire human rights situation in North Korea and to expand humanitarian aid. But with no concrete progress made in inter-Korean relations so far, some are calling Liu's plans unrealistic. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. The top diplomats from Korea and Japan will meet in New York on Thursday on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly. Korean Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-hye and his Japanese counterpart Fumio Kishida are expected to discuss long-standing historical and territorial differences and the security situation on the Korean Peninsula. The two last met on the sidelines of the ASEAN Regional Forum in August. The talks come after Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe sent a written request to hold summit talks with President Park Geun-hye. Korea will likely reiterate that Japan must show sincerity over Tokyo's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women before talks can take place. Your gateway to the day's biggest stories in Korea and around the world. Breaking news, the hottest interviews, and a whole lot more. Join Arirang Sean Lim and Kang Chae Ri from the heart of Seoul. News begins now. Primetime News, weeknights, live at 10 on Arirang TV. Samsung Electronics and Hyundai Motor are the two main pillars of Korea's stock market, taking up more than 15 percent of the total market cap. But investor sentiment has not been so hot for these two names in recent months. Our Connie Kim has more. Poor performances from Korea's top two companies are reshaping the country's stock market. The share movement of Samsung Electronics and Hyundai Motor used to dictate the trend of the Korean boards, but their influence has diminished recently, with many other companies moving in the other direction. Samsung and Hyundai peaked at a combined 25 percent of overall market capitalization in June, but the dramatic drops in their share prices in recent months have knocked their combined share value down to less than 16 percent. Roughly 60 billion U.S. dollars have been wiped off the valuation of the two companies in the past year. In contrast, companies specializing in communications, textiles, apparel, banking and other financial sectors have seen their prices go up by more than 20 percent in less than three months. This is partly because the Korean government began injecting $25 billion into the economy to spur domestic spending and accelerate a recovery. The poor performances from Samsung and Hyundai are being blamed on the strengthened Korean currency and other structural problems. In the case of Samsung, the smartphone market worldwide has reached a saturation point, leading to a decrease in exports of Samsung handsets. Hyundai's recent purchase of land in Seoul for $10 billion has spurred worries of the company's cash flows. Many component makers in the auto and electronics industries have seen their shares drop by more than 10 percent over the past three months. Connie Kim, Arirang News. 
Korea's individual debt to GDP ratio has come in at the highest in Asia. That's according to insurance group Allianz's Global Wealth Report. Korea's ratio stood at 93% last year when the average of the 53 countries surveyed stood at around 65%. The Allianz report warned of household debt defaults uh, starting with the working class for countries like Korea and Malaysia if interest rates go back up or interest uh, economic growth slows down. The face of the average Korean will look much different by the year 2100. That's according to the Korea Face Institute, which conducted a computer simulation based on, 20, on photographs of some 20,000 Koreans. By the year 2100, the institute says the average Korean male will have thicker eyebrows and a wider forehead, while females will have double eyelids, which is one of the most popularly performed cosmetic surgeries on Korean women. One of the main reasons behind the changes was attributed to the steady inflow of foreigners coming to Korea, particularly from Southeast Asia, as more multicultural families are formed. Even after its markets opened up, the rush to capture Chinese consumers still continues. And as our Pak Ji-won reports, one group that has paved its way into that lucrative market with the help of Chinese partners is Korean filmmakers. A wedding invitation is a film co-produced by Korea and China, released last year. This romantic comedy made a huge splash in China, earning some 36 million U.S. dollars, 10 times more than the film's production cost. The film's Korean director, Oh gi Hwan says he changed the film's scenario many times to make it appeal to Chinese viewers. At first, I tried to remake my previous film, A Gift. But then I realized that the Chinese viewers didn't quite get some parts of the original script due to cultural differences. So I've rewritten almost everything with three Chinese scenario writers. He says it's not easy to strike the right balance between both Korean and Chinese elements in one film, but says tapping into China's fast-growing market is certainly a risk worth taking. There are forecasts that by 2017, the Chinese film market will be bigger than Hollywood. So it's a challenge that is worth trying. China raked in some 3.6 billion U.S. dollars in box office revenue last year, making it the world's second largest market, growing around 30 percent annually. And over the next decade, the gap between the Korean and Chinese movie markets will only grow larger. The two countries signed a groundbreaking film co-production pact in July that opened a door of opportunities for Korean filmmakers. But before then, it was difficult to break the wall of China's strict film import quota system. Due to the film import quota, only about 70 foreign films got the chance to release in China, and half of those spots were taken by Hollywood films. That's why this co-production pact is important, because it helps Korean-Chinese co-productions be recognized as homegrown films. Another encouraging development for film creators from both countries is a joint investment fund worth nearly 200 million U.S. dollars, which will be set up next year for co-production projects. Both countries share a common goal of stimulating their content's markets through the active exchange facilitated by the joint fund. The joint film projects are shaping up to be a win-win strategy, allowing seasoned Korean filmmakers to test their creations in a bigger market, while China can gain from Korea's production experience and expertise. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. U.S. President Barack Obama has called for a globally united response to destroy the militant group Islamic State. With more, we turn to Paul Yee at the News Center. Paul, this is Obama's latest call to action against the jihadist group, which has left a wake of violence across Iraq and Syria. That's right, and this has been one of the most pressing issues at this year's U.N. General Assembly. Addressing world leaders in New York, President Obama described IS as a network of death and stressed that urgent action needed to be taken to counter this threat. This as dozens of more nations have now answered that call. Our Hong Jie has more. 
Facing the mounting threat from terrorist groups, U.S. President Barack Obama made it clear at the United Nations General Assembly on Wednesday that the U.S. will confront and dismantle Islamic terrorists. He urged nations to reject the cancer of violent extremism. The only language understood by killers like this is the language of force. So the United States of America will work with a broad coalition to dismantle this network of death. He went on to asking the world to join the effort. And already over 40 nations have offered to join this coalition. Today I ask the world to join in this effort. Following the U.N. meeting, the Security Council unanimously approved a resolution that calls on countries to adopt laws stating that joining a militant group like the Islamic State is a serious crime for their citizens. Over in Syria, U.S.-led airstrikes continued to hit Islamic State positions on Wednesday. The U.S. Central Command said they pounded a dozen targets in Syria, such as small-scale oil refineries that have been providing millions of dollars a day to the terrorist group. But Islamic State fighters continue to make advances. They have intensified their attacks near the Turkish border in northern Syria, where 140,000 civilians have fled in recent days. Huang Jie, Arirang News. And the IS militants aren't just posing a threat in Iraq and Syria. A group linked to the extremist group in Algeria claims to have beheaded another Western hostage, this time from France. President Francois Hollande has condemned the brutal killing and vowed to push forward with airstrikes in Iraq. However, similar threats have now emerged against other countries and their citizens. Our Kim Jian reports. It has been confirmed that French tourist Hervé Gourdel has been executed by a group in Algeria linked to the Islamic State forces. Gourdel was kidnapped earlier this week by fighters of the Jun al Khilafa, or soldiers of the Caliphate, who threatened to kill him if France did not end its campaign against IS militants in Iraq. French President Francois Hollande condemned the brutality of Gourdel's death and vowed to continue his country's military operations against the IS. Obe Gauder is dead because he was French, because his country. France is fighting terrorism. My determination is total, and this aggression only strengthens it. We will continue to fight terrorism everywhere against the Islamic State, which spreads death in Iraq and Syria. The threat is also spreading to other countries. In the Philippines, an al-Qaeda elite militant group known as Abu Saif says it will kill two German hostages, first reported missing in April, unless Germany withdraws its support for U.S.-led airstrikes in Iraq and Syria. They are also asking for a ransom of more than 5.6 million U.S. dollars. The Islamic State is also suspected of delivering a threatening letter to the presidential office of the Czech Republic. In response to the nation's support for Kurdish British forces in Iraq who are fighting the militant group. Local authorities are investigating the contents of the letter, which contained a white powdery substance. But unlike France and Germany, the Czech Republic is not one of the countries participating in airstrikes against the IS. Kim Jong, Anina News. And turning to Japan, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has made womenomics a buzzword for the country's economic reforms, but it appears that the workplace still remains a harsh environment for female employees. Government data shows that while there's a growing number of Japanese women who continue to work after having their first child, reported cases of discrimination are also on the rise. It's been a chronic problem compounded by Japan's aging population and low birth rate. Tokyo has vowed to tackle the issue by increasing the number of women in business leadership positions from 11 to 30 percent by 2020. Meanwhile, support groups have been cropping up to help women who have experienced so-called maternity harassment and are pushing for change. The head of HR told me that if I wanted to come back to work, I should give up on getting pregnant. Rather than focusing on a small portion of elite women who are top managers, I'd like them to start by dealing with problems affecting women like us at the bottom. Economists say that unless women take a more active role, the nation's future could be at stake, a sentiment which was echoed by IMF Chief Christine Lagarde. She said that the global economy is not making use of a great potential and that change was needed, not for women's sake, not just for women's sake, rather, but for economy's sake. 
And finally, the U.S. tech giant Apple is in the headlines again, but this time for an apparent design flaw in their latest gadget. Dubbed BenGate, some early adopters have started complaining that their new iPhone 6 is bending out of shape just a week after the smartphone was released. Technology websites have jumped on the problem, testing the limits of the phone's aluminum shell. They found that the larger iPhone 6 Plus was the most prone to curving. Analysts say the issue has become inherent with newer mobile devices as they race towards sleeker and more lightweight designs. Devices thinner. This is definitely going to be an issue for Apple if it becomes really widespread. If we're seeing a ton of people whose phones are bending when they're just putting it in their front pocket, this could definitely become a major issue and a major concern. These are very expensive devices, and you expect them to hold up for at least two years, which is the term of the cell contracts in the U.S. Apple spokespeople did not immediately respond to the claims, but experts say a mass product recall is unlikely and that Apple may instead issue free cases just like they did to solve an antenna problem with the iPhone 4. Nonetheless, this development is likely to create a publicity crisis for what's on track to become the company's best-selling device yet. And that wraps up our look at international stories making headlines around the world. I'll see you back here tomorrow. Hello and welcome to Thursday's Asian Games Update. We start with the men's football tournament round of 16 where South Korea met Hong Kong. It all took place at Koyang Sports Complex. In the first half, the Koreans dominated the pitch, lining up shot after shot, but to no avail. But relief came in the 59th minute when Lee Yong Jae slammed a laser off the top post. Park Joo drilled one in in the 78th. South Korea eventually got the win 3-0. And with Japan's 4-0 win over Palestine earlier in the day, the two rivals will meet in the quarterfinals on Sunday. And off the grass and into the pool, it was the much-anticipated 100-meter freestyle final, and the pressure was on Pak Tae-hwan to get his first gold of the games. But a new Asiad record from China's Ning Zetao in the race denied Pak first place as he had to settle for silver. Pak did, however, he, well, he tied the Korean record for the most ever medals won at the Asian Games, further cementing his legacy as an all-time great. Meanwhile, Yang jung doo he joined Pak in Korea's medal hall, grabbing bronze in the 50-meter butterfly, and the women's 4x100-meter medley relay team earned the silver as well. And on to vault in artistic gymnastics, South Korea's Yang hak Sun was by far the favorite to take the gold, but Hong Kong's Shek Wai Hung sneaked in to the top spot. Yang's two attempts combined for a higher score, but a penalty he earned on his first try for a shaky landing brought his score under Shek's by a hair, 0.016 to be exact. That proved to be the difference in metal shades. Hong Kong's Shek's gets the gold, Yang the silver. Now on to weightlifting. China's Kang Yue snatched an Asian record 131 kilos but could not stop North Korea's Kim Eun-ju from winning the women's 75 kilo division gold. Kim responded to Kang's challenge by setting a new record, or world record that is, of 164 kilos in the clean and jerk. Her total score of 292 was good enough for both a new Asian Games record and a victory. And that wraps it up for now. This has been Stephen Che. I leave you with the medal standings and a look at Friday's events. Good night.
Happy Thursday. Welcome. I'm Kim bo -kyuk with the latest updates. It was a lovely autumn day here in Seoul, but earlier today, eastern coastal regions woke up to rainy conditions, which quickly cleared up by the afternoon. Not much in the forecast for tomorrow besides the fact that it is shaping up to be a sunny and breezy Friday. But keep in mind the big gap in temperatures between the day and night, so a light cardigan will come in handy after the sun sets. Over at Incheon for the Asian Games, out Outdoor matches should be in action tomorrow under clear skies. On to Friday's readings. Well, Seoul, Daegu, and Busan make it to 26, Gwangju 28. On to other places. Daejeon and Jeju hit 25, Dokdo and Mount Kumgang 22. That's your weather for this hour. I'll be back with more updates after midnight. See you then. Thanks, Po Gyeong. And that's primetime news on this Thursday. I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for watching. And I'm Kang Chedi. We'll see you tomorrow at the same time. Good night.